decade brimmed with innovation. Speed, more than ever before. Extreme fashion statements, new wave music, the first launch of the Space Shuttle and the continuing allure of Concord, a peak in arcade gaming, and the introduction of the Game Boy. We had fire-breathing Group B rally cars, turbo-powered rocket ships dominating Formula One, and amidst this golden era of motorsport, we had Le Mans prototypes with downforce, unfathomable acceleration, noise, flames, speed, ridiculous speed. I am talking about the 1980s. I am talking about Group C. A brand new set of regulations were brought into the World Sports Car Championship ahead of the 1982 season, with Group C the headline act. This was a new class of car, taking inspiration from both the Group 5 and Group 6 categories that had preceded it. The idea was simple, limit the cars via fuel consumption rather than engine size, in order to prevent manufacturers from simply increasing boost pressure for more and more power. This allowed bigger normally aspirated engines to compete on a level playing field with smaller turbocharged engines. The approach of using fuel consumption to naturally regulate performance didn't please everyone at first. Many drivers, in fact, thought this would lead to boring races that were more like glorified economy runs. Still, many manufacturers gave these new regulations a go, with an eclectic variety of approaches. Some took their previous Group 6 and IMSA GTP designs and adapted them, such as Ford with their C100s, Rondo with their M382s, and Lola with their T610s. Lancia had just developed a new Group 6 car, the LC1, so weren't ready for the switch to Group C just yet. Some built brand new Group C cars from the ground up. Sauber with the SHS C6s, the Aston Martin Nimrods, the WMP82, and Mirage with their M12, a car which was controversially disqualified 20 minutes before the start of the 24-hour in 1982, never to be seen again. And there was also the reigning champions Porsche with their fleet of 956s. All of these cars were unique. All were interesting, all had their benefits and drawbacks, and their flash-in-the-pan moments of success and optimism. But one of these cars in particular was on a completely separate planet when compared to the rest. That car was, of course, the Porsche. Their 956, which would, in a few years' time, with a few small modifications, become this 962, was, quite simply, the most successful Le Mans car ever built. It was so good in fact and so reliable, so fast, that it took their competitors years to catch up with them. 1982 was its debut race and they managed to lock out the podium with the small works team. And then in 1983, with satellite cars involved as well, they finished first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth and tenth. So they locked out the top eight and had P10. Absolutely remarkable, just mind-blowing. Things got a little bit tougher for them in 1984 because Lancia had finally gotten on top of their LC2, meaning they took pole position by a big margin as well and were actually leading until about halfway through the race. But eventually, reliability problems struck them and Porsche were just too quick and too reliable. And in the end, even without a works Rothmans team by the way, just satellite teams, they still managed to lock out the top seven positions. There are no words for that kind of dominance. This Rothmans liveried car was, you know, often pictured with Derek Bell and Jackie X behind the wheel. That's kind of how it's remembered. And this was probably the period of time where those two were most dominant and Porsche were just super, super dominant. Jackie X picking up six wins overall by the end of his career, Derek Bell picking up five. And it's just such an iconic car. I mean, this car is available in so many racing games. It's probably one of the most readily available Le Mans winners over the years across so many different games. <laughs> and it, it's just spectacular. Now back in 1986, we actually saw the first inclusion of Le Mans in a video game. This was the video game. It's called WEC Le Mans. It was an arcade game made by Konami and featured the actual Porsche that we're talking about at the moment. It is very difficult. I am very, very terrible at it. And it's also amazing playing it now to see just how far racing games and sim racing has come since the mid-80s. That wasn't good. Whilst fans at home were getting their first taste of driving at Le Mans, the Porsche juggernaut at the real circuit continued relentlessly. By this time, other major manufacturers were at least beginning to make meaningful progress behind the scenes. 
Jaguar were continually improving their XJRs, Tom's Toyota arrived in 1985 with Nissan following suit a year later, Sauber weren't going anywhere either, nor were the Cougars and WMs. Equally, Mazda had been playing about in the slower C2 category as well, constantly improving and learning. As everybody else edged closer and closer to contendership, Porsche were making history. In the early 60s, Ferrari managed to win six times in a row, and at the time of making this video, two other manufacturers have since managed five wins in a row. Porsche, from 1981 to 1987, won seven consecutive Le Mans 24-hour races. It's no surprise then that this Porsche has featured in so many racing games over the years, a true Le Mans legend without a shadow of a doubt. Throughout this period of utter domination, motorsport as a whole was in a bit of a strange place. Rally cars were faster than ever, constantly walking the tightrope between magic and tragedy. Formula 1 cars now had over a thousand brake horsepower and quality trim. Although it was fair to say that safety levels were increasing, speeds were increasing faster. This led to a number of serious incidents across the board. Injury, and even death, was still a common and unwelcome presence at the highest level of motorsport. Le Mans, sadly, was no exception. In 1981, Jean-Louis Lafosse lost his life as a mechanical failure resulted in a head-on collision with a barrier on the Mulsanne Strait. This crash also injured two marshals, and three years later, another massive accident on the Mulsanne, this time for the Aston Martin Nimrod of John Sheldon, resulted in the death of Marshal Jackie Loiseau. Another marshal and Sheldon himself were seriously injured in the crash, but were extremely fortunate to escape with their lives. The Mulsan Strait back then was six kilometres long, with no chicanes to slow the cars down, so it wasn't really a surprise that with the ever-increasing speeds, any kind of incident there was a serious matter. Another two years on, in 1986, Joe Gartner's Porsche 962 suffered a mechanical failure. Once again, it was on the Mulsanne Strait, with the car being sent straight into the Armco barriers before launching into a series of rolls, taking out telephone poles and trees along the way. Joe, a 32-year-old ex-Formula 1 driver, lost his life. It's no surprise that the Mulsanne was beginning to claim more and more victims. Group C speeds by this point were reaching mind-boggling levels, with the WM P88 reaching 405 kilometers an hour, or 251 miles per hour in 1988. Something had to change before more lives were lost. In 1987, the Dunlop chicane was added to the monstrous Dunlop corner, which would slow the cars down after the pit straight. The most important change, however, would take place in 1990, with the addition of two chicanes along the Mulsanne Strait, splitting it into three separate sections. This slowed the overall lap times and speeds, of course, but not as much as you might think, considering the rate of car development at the time. The important thing, in reality, was that the cars would be under less strain for prolonged periods of time, reducing mechanical failures such as punctures, which were often the cause of these horrendous accidents. That, and the fact that it met the FIA's new regulations for the length of straights on race circuits. All in all, the track retained its magic whilst becoming a safer place to race, something that we can all be grateful for today. Joe Gartner's death would be the last to take place during a 24-hour Le Mans race for another 27 years. With layout changes improving safety, Group C cars remained in action, and whilst other disciplines such as rallying and Formula One were looking for ways to slow their cars down, Le Mans continued to flourish, and entered what many regard as its greatest ever era. By 1988, Porsche's main competition had finally gotten their act together. In the top C1 class, we had competitive factory efforts from Porsche, Toyota, Jaguar, Nissan, and Sauber, amongst many others. Porsche still managed to lock out the top three spots in qualifying, and much like in 87, their closest competition came from the TWR Silk Cut Jaguar team with their XJR9s. In the early 80s, Jaguar were focusing on IMSA over in America, and worked together with Group 44, which were an American racing team, to develop the XJR5. Now that made its Le Mans debut in 1984, and Jaguar kind of, I guess, got excited about Le Mans and wanted to do something a bit more serious. So while Group 54 continued to focus on American IMSA racing, Jaguar went and spoke to Tom Walkinshaw. TWR produced the XJR6 specifically for Group C regulations for the World Sports Car Championship and they continued to develop this car over the years. In 1987, they added an insane V12 engine, and then in 1988, they had this, the XGR9, and this thing was ridiculous. They entered five cars at Le Mans in 1988, with a star-studded lineup including Brundle, Lammers, Dumfries, Andy Wallace, Henri Pescarolo, Larry Perkins, Jan Lammers, they had drivers from all over the world. And this team was formidable. 
It was an intense battle throughout the race between Jaguar and Porsche, of course. Both cars suffered some reliability issues. The Jaguars were probably the quickest at the end of the day. And despite being stuck in fourth gear for much of the latter part of the race, the Jaguar number two car with Lammers, Dumfries and Andy Wallace came home and took a memorable win. One of the most memorable in Le Mans history, in fact. The images of the three Jaguars in formation crossing the line, not all of them on the same lap, I should say. They, those are some of the most iconic photos in Le Mans history. There were so many people there. The crowds were huge. It kind of did signify a magical golden moment in the history of this great race. The Porsche juggernaut had finally been taken care of, they'd finally been beaten, and that wasn't a trend that was going to stop anytime soon. On a separate note, you may have noticed I'm using Gran Turismo 7 for this segment, which is the first time I've used Gran Turismo 7 in this History of Le Mans video series. But Gran Turismo and Group C, for me, go hand in hand. Like Ever since I was a kid, I used to love driving the Group C cars back in Gran Turismo 4, and these cars have always been a staple of the series ever since. Whenever I think of this Jaguar XGR9, I instantly think of Gran Turismo 4. It was just magnificent. So back at the Le Mans race itself, and heading into 1989, other manufacturers now knew that Porsche could actually be beaten. Sauber had been present pretty much throughout the entirety of Group C's existence, but they were never super competitive. It took them a while, much like Jaguar, for them to actually find their feet, their C8s, picking up the odd good result, but never really fighting amongst the top guys. Then in 1987, they launched this, the Sauber C9. And it didn't go great at first, to be honest. Even in 1988, while Jaguar were out celebrating a historic victory, Sauber actually pulled out before the race even started due to tyre safety concerns. Not great for them. However, the following year, 1989, Mercedes kind of stepped up their game, helped out a little bit more, and suddenly, Sauber Mercedes were a force to be reckoned with. After locking out the front row and qualifying, Sauber Mercedes would go on to secure a historic 1-2 victory. Jaguar and Porsche had absolutely nothing to fight with. And there is a lot to love about this car. I mean, 700 horsepower in race trim, actually more than that. 5 litre V8 engine, twin turbos. This thing must have caused earthquakes going down the Mulsanne. This was, of course, the final year that we actually saw the full Mulsanne straight, all 6 kilometres. The year after, the chicanes were added, things were shortened. And to be honest, this year, when Mercedes dominated in 1989, their top speed was a big part of that. They were actually the second quickest car in the whole field behind the WM Peugeots that were doing 250. We spoke about them a little bit earlier. So these things, you know, were so fast in a straight, it's not that surprising that really that they were able to be so dominant. You may have noticed that I'm uh, currently driving this car on Assetto Corsa and not Gran Turismo 7. Well, there is a reason for that, and that is that the car in Gran Turismo 7 was too expensive and I couldn't afford it. But hey-ho. To be honest, this is another one of those cars that you can get in so many different sim racing and racing game titles. It's just such a fun car to drive. Things really were in a great place at Lasarth. Races were thrilling, audiences massive, and drivers viewed as gladiatorially as ever. Big manufacturers were spending a fortune on the sport, with Porsche, Jaguar, Toyota, Nissan, Mazda, and several others with their eyes on the top step. Sauber took a year out in 1990 as Le Mans wasn't around of the World Sports Car Championship that year and their new C11s were yet to have a low drag configuration developed. They would return in 1991. With no Sauber Mercedes entered in 90 then, it was actually Nissan that dominated qualifying, with Mark Blundell setting a famous pole lap by over 6 seconds. Weirdly, the gap was only as big as it was because he had a turbo problem, resulting in full turbo pressure for the whole lap and therefore a faster car in the short term. Talk about fortuitous. The race, however, didn't prove quite as fortunate. Jaguar were simply too strong, and took home their second victory in three years, this time going to Nielsen, Cobb and Brundle in the number 3 XGR12. In 1991, however, something very different would take the top step. If you are a true racing fan, all you will need to do is listen to this car to know exactly what car it is. Of course, it is the Mazda 787B and it's rotary lump of magic. What I would do to listen to this thing drive by in a Le Mans Classic event, it would just be perfection. Now, I know I've said this about all of the Group C cars so far, this one really is a fan favorite, and the others are too, but this one specifically. I mean, if I'm picking myself between this Mazda, the Jaguar, the Sauber, the Porsche, I'm having this Mazda. I'm having the Mazda every single time. 
The story of the 1991 Le Mans race was a strange one, and it's a bit complicated, but basically the rules changed at the start of the season, so you had new engine regulations, and this meant we had some returning manufacturers using older cars, we had some using newer cars, but with weight penalties, and we had some with new cars from the ground up. You still had Porsche and Jaguar, but they were using older cars. You also had Sauber, which had now become fully Mercedes. They were quick, and Peugeot as well, a new contender from France, they were quick too. In fact, the Peugeot and the, the Mercedes were definitely the quickest in the field heading into the race. However, early on, the Peugeots failed, and late on, the Mercedes failed. And that basically left the road open for Mazda to come through and take what was a very surprising victory at the time, and importantly, the first ever victory for a Japanese manufacturer. Now, since then, other manufacturers in Japan have gone on to win Le Mans multiple times. Mazda never won it again, though. That does not mean that the 1991 effort and the 787B will be forgotten. I mean, how the hell could it be? It's so good. Group C never really recovered from the change in engine regulations, and the entries began to dwindle, ultimately leading to the demise of the World Sports Car Championship at the end of 92. That year at Le Mans would see the lowest number of entries in the history of the race, with home heroes Peugeot taking their first win in the eclectic 905 EVO 1, sort of a forgotten gem in my opinion, with Toyota providing the stiffest challenge. This Peugeot, like many other Group C efforts, can be found on Gran Turismo 4. Another win for Peugeot in 1993 followed, but by this stage, Group C had ground to a shuddering halt. Sadly, this meant we never got to see Peugeot's next effort, the gorgeous 905 EVO 2 Supercopter, actually enter a race. Looking at that car, it certainly represents the earliest example of what would go on to become the recognised style of modern Le Mans prototypes, with its extreme aero making it almost single-seater-like, with a bit of extra bodywork covering the wheels. All in all, Group C had been a blast. This era went down in history as one of the most exciting times for Le Mans and endurance racing, but ultimately, things had to move on. Major regulation changes would follow in 1994, resulting in what felt like a bit of an identity crisis. This was a weird year for the sport. The ACO wanted to balance things at the top, so searched for a way to allow the ever-present but slower production-based GT cars to have a fighting chance against the prototypes. This involved heavily limiting power of the LMPs, amongst other things, to bring the pack closer together. The pole lap in 1994 was 26 seconds slower than the year before, with a GT1 class car only 2 seconds off the pace in 5th position. This was no ordinary GT car though. Spotting a loophole in the regulations, Porsche, in conjunction with Dower Racing, homologated their now 10-year-old 962, essentially turning their purpose-built race car into what was technically a road car. This move allowed them to legally enter the GT class instead of the LMP class, and perhaps unsurprisingly, with far less restrictions, this car took home the win. It was far from straightforward, however, as Toyota's purpose-built LMP1 car led comfortably before gearbox failure dropped them heartbreakingly to second with an hour to go. This win may have been controversial and a little bit against the spirit of Le Mans, but the result was a win for what was now essentially a 10-year-old car. This was the cherry on top of the cake, the final chapter in the legendary Porsche 956 and 962 story. Ferrari returned to prototype racing in 1995 with their stunning 333 SPs. The LMP1 class had become the world sports car class to align better with the still flourishing IMSA series. There were plenty of quick prototypes around, but it was GT1 that was causing the biggest stir. Ferrari also had their F40s, Jaguar their XJ220s. There was a Lister Storm, a Venturi, and an influx of Japanese GT machines from Honda, Nissan, and Toyota. Another manufacturer had just built the fastest road car in the world, and they too wanted a slice of the GT1 action. Not sure if you've ever heard of this one, the McLaren F1 GTR? Any recollection? Nope. This car had already taken the GT world by storm before Le Mans, absolutely dominating the BPR Global GT series, and by the way, I recommend going and watching those races on YouTube from this era because the cars were just insane. So much fun. Chucking it around, you've got large amounts of power. It's quite a messy car to drive, really. Lots of power sliding. Not, of course, the ultimate downforce and aero that you had with the prototypes around it. But it's so much fun. Look at this. Don't, don't look at that. The 6.0-litre BMW V12 engine was the same engine that was in the road car as well. 
And the 1995 Le Mans story with this car is one of my favourite underdog stories at Le Mans in its entire history. Basically, five out of the six cars qualified outside of the top ten overall. But the rain came down, lots of the world sports cars fell by the wayside, lots of mechanical issues, lots of accidents, and by the time it got to the middle of the night, there were actually three McLarens out in front. One, two, three. And the pace in the rain was really, really strong, as well as the reliability and consistency. Despite a late recovery drive by the prototype courage of Andretti, Hellery and Wallach, it was the number 59 black McLaren F1 Lazante Motorsports that took a historic victory. Their debut victory as well, and a debut for the car, something that had never really been done before. It was also the first win for a Finnish driver, JJ Leto, and a first win for a Japanese driver with Sakia. And they were also partnered by the legendary Yannick Dalmas. I'm not worried about using the word legendary with Yannick. So yeah, you can kind of see, considering the fact that this was a purpose-built GT car and not a prototype, why this was such a historic win at the time, and to be honest, remains to this day. You may be wondering once again why I'm driving this car on a set of Corsa and not Gran Turismo 7, when Gran Turismo 7 actually has the number 59 Lazante Motorsport car. Uh, well, the answer is, I went to the Legend dealership to buy it, and looked at how much it was going to cost, and it was going to cost me 88 quid of real money just to get the car in Gran Turismo. So make of that what you will. An incredible story had just unfolded, and for many manufacturers and teams across the globe, GT1 was the place to be. After all, these largely production car-inspired designs would help shift their road cars. In 1996, over 100 entry applications were submitted to the ACO. Despite factory-backed competition from America, Japan and Italy, it was McLaren and Porsche with their brand new 911 GT1 that dominated the category. Neither would win overall though, as another Porsche prototype took the spoils. I say Porsche, it was run by Yoast and actually built by Tom Walkinshaw and his team using the gorgeous Jaguar XGR14 chassis as a base, which then had its roof pulled off and a 3 litre turbocharged Porsche engine dropped in to comply with the regulations. I'm sure it was a little more dignified and nuanced than that. The same car would win again the following year, a young Dane called Tom Christensen taking his first Le Mans victory, and this GT1 vs LMP era was yet to reach its peak. This would, in my opinion, happen in 1998. We had an incredible manufacturer entry, so many different teams and cars, so many different interpretations of the same rules. Oh, 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 there's a McLaren. That's not great. Each car had its own sense of style, its own sound, its own design philosophy, its own engine. Basically, every single car was interesting for a different reason. What are these AI cars doing today? McLaren were back with the long tail version of their F1 GTR. We had Porsche with a brand new development of their 911 GT1, a completely different version. You also had Toyota with their GT1 car, which kind of looked more like an LMP to be honest than a GT1 car, but it was actually a GT car, and that was pretty competitive as well. Then you had Nissan with their R390. You had Mercedes with their CLK, the car that was absolutely dominating the FIA GT Championship at the time. And then we have this, the Panos. 6 litre Ford V8 engine which was actually in the front of the car instead of the middle or the rear like everyone else. And this unique nature makes it for me one of the best GT1 cars and also kind of just summarises what's so good about GT1 in the first place. You've got all these different cars, all with a slight feeling of production car to them, but everyone had a unique take on the design. Every car was different, every manufacturer thought they were exploiting something that was better than the other, and it just created this amazing class of car. And actually, for me, on a personal level, I genuinely believe that this was the best class of car ever to race at Le Mans. I think, especially in the future, this will go down in the memory. Because these cars just scream personality. They weren't as quick, obviously, as Group C's. But they all looked just a bit different. And they kind of all had different flaws as well, which I loved about it. From a gaming perspective, the reason I've jumped on Project Cars 2 for the first time in this part is simply because Project Cars 2 has all six of the GT1 cars I mentioned before. This game is a fantastic gateway to experience not only the amazing qualities of the GT1 cars, but also to be able to compare the differences. If you jump in each different one, you'll notice they all feel and sound and look very, very different. So it's one thing that Project Cars 2 gets very right. As quickly as GT1 arrived and prospered, GT1 disappeared. Despite Porsche's latest 911 taking the outright win at Le Mans in 98, it was actually the success of Mercedes in the aforementioned FIA GT Championship that led to the category's downfall. Nobody entered the series in 99, and quickly the cards toppled. 
all of a sudden, the Great Race's class structure was changed yet again, with a renewed focus on the top prototype class. 1999's edition of the 24 Hour would be remembered for a number of reasons, one of which was a new manufacturer taking on the top class of Le Mans for the very first time. It was a brand new car that would go on to define the modern era at Le Sarth, a design that would rival that of Porsche's Group C machine, engineering perfection that changed the game and set new standards for prototype racing going forward. That car? The Audi R8. Thanks once again for joining us on this journey through Le Mans history, and make sure you subscribe to the channel so that in future you don't miss the release of part 3. We will tell the story of that dramatic 1999 edition, and take you right up to the present day. This is, of course, a story still being written, and one which we all hope will continue throughout our lifetime. Until I see you again, thank you so much for watching, keep it pinned, and have a great day.